Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to Roosevelt House, the beautifully restored home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, my name is Lev Sertoff. I'm the director of the Macaulay Honors College here at Hunter College, and it's my great honor and privilege to extend a warm welcome to all of you and our distinguished guest on behalf of President Jennifer J. Rabb, who wanted to be here this evening but was unable to attend. This evening's presentation on Russia is near and dear to my heart. As someone who left Russia 25 years ago, I was really hoping to leave it and have it leave me. In my optimistic and perhaps naive way, I wanted to focus on my education, professional and personal growth, enjoying baseball and Sunday softball. In an all-American existence that was frequently interrupted by my mom, uh, a Russian dissident and writer who sees Russian involvement in all major national and international events. She saw what many did not. Russian aggression not just in proxy wars with the West, but attacking the fundamentals of our democratic processes. As in the Soviet days, mom was in the forefront of defending freedom and recognizing real threats. Likewise, Ambassador Mike McFall had not only to recognize the threats to American and Western interests, but he had the responsibility for producing policies and strategies to advance our national agenda. He's a lifelong debater and has committed the entirety of his adult life on preparing himself for direct engagement with Russia, having earned a BA in international relations and Slavic languages and an MA in Slavic and Eastern European studies from Stanford University. He attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar where he earned a DPhil in international relations. And after a marked stint as US ambassador to Russia, he is now back in Stanford in capacity of professor of political science. This evening, Ambassador McFall will be discussing his latest book titled From Cold War to Hot Peace, An American Ambassador in Putin's Russia. In this book, Ambassador McFall takes a deep dive on history, history of policy, on the, and, and, excuse me, and on the internal mindset of the Russian leadership as the world sees an ideological and physical clash of civilizations yet again. Reading through the accounts of the reset attempts I was reminded of just such a reset line from the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. In advising President Reagan on what to say to Gorbachev, she said, quote, tell him this, we know that you are entitled as we are to feel secure and that we accept that the world cannot be safe for one of us unless it is safe for both of us. As some of you may know, the Hunter motto is mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. If we are to have a prosperous, and secure future, we have to get it right with Russia. With that, let's welcome Ambassador McFall. Thank you for that great introduction, uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I've written lots of books before, um, 12, I think, if you count the ones I edited. I've never written a book with the word I in it before. Uh, and that's what this book is. It's, it's a different book for me in that there is an analytic story. There's a big story about the history of U.S.-Russian relations, and I'm going to spend most of my time tonight, because I'm at a college, we're going to be analytic. Uh, but the, just to tease you a bit, buy the book if you don't want to know about that stuff, and we want to know what it's like to be an ambassador, uh, to do the two-step in Spasso House. I see some people here uh, who did that with me. Great to see you guys here. And because the book bounces around between the personal story of my own life and the analytic story. So tonight, I'm going to focus on the, the analytic piece. Every now and then, I'll tell you some stories about my own life. And in questions, we can talk about whatever you want. Uh, we can talk about Barack Obama's jump shot. We can talk about living in Spasso House. Uh, the floor will be wide open. All right, but let's talk a little bit about the, the arc of the story, and it's a, it's a pretty simple question that I want to get to. I was scared in the Cold War. I was frightened by some of the things that President Reagan was saying. I was a student in 1981 at Stanford, and as a 17-year-old kid from Montana, going to the, the, the big state, the, the foreign state, what my mother called the communist state of California, uh, <laughs> She was worried that I was going to go there and grow long hair and become a communist. And I did grow long hair. Uh, and the, the June, my sophomore year, I called up my mom. Uh, I'd never been abroad before, by the way. Neither had she. And I said, hey, guess what, mom? I'm going to go study in the Soviet Union. 
which back then was referred to by our president as the evil empire. And I did that because I was, I had a theory as a young kid, as a kid in high school, and then in, when I got to Stanford as an undergraduate, that if we could just get to know the Russians, and sometimes back then we called them the Soviets, we could reduce tensions, and, and maybe we couldn't reduce all tensions, but the, it was the misunderstanding, at least that was my hypothesis, that drove this uh, conflict. And that's why in the summer of uh, 1983, I took my first trip abroad to Leningrad to study at Leningrad State University. So for me, when the Cold War ended, and our relations became closer at the end of 1991, in the early 1990s, I thought that was a glorious moment. And I want to say that emphatically. I thought this was an exciting time because Russians back then, some of them were my friends, uh, wanted to be closer to the West. They wanted to build markets. They wanted to build democracy. And it seemed like the Cold War was ending. And I was excited to be a part of it living again as I did in 1990-91, uh, this time at Moscow State University. So I'm from Montana State University. I had MGU, MSU. I had both those t-shirts back then. Um, and it was pretty exciting. And it seemed like, if you remember, one of our colleagues, Frank Fukuyama, wrote a very famous essay back then called The End of History. It seemed like the ideas of liberalism and democracy and capitalism were on our side and the rest of the world including Russia, wanted to join that world. So fast forward to today. Uh, a couple years ago, I was at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, I ran into my old colleague, uh, now Prime Minister, then President when I knew him well, and noticed the year that he compared it to. 1962, obviously, that's the Cuban Missile Crisis. Our own President up, went a step further on Twitter, of course, um, and said that things today are worse than the Cold War. So what happened? What happened between the, the period of the Cold War and the hot peace? I'm not going to go through this slide. We can maybe talk about it in questions, because I want to get to the heart of, of the explanation. But you can compare and contrast and decide whether we're better off or worse off today during what I call the hot peace than we were during the Cold War. And I deliberately call it the hot peace to echo the Cold War. But I also want to say it's different, because I don't think it is a return to the Cold War. Some of the pieces of our hot piece, though, are even more frightening to me. In the last days of the Cold War, the last decades of the Cold War, there was never annexation. That's now happened. In the last decades of the Cold War, the chief of staff of the Kremlin was never on the sanctions list. That's part of our hot piece. So, Maybe in questions we can get into this if you're interested in the com uh, comparison. But I think we would all agree we're a long ways from the optimism of the end of the Cold War that uh, I just showed you before 30 years ago. So that's what I want to explain. What the hell happened uh, between these two photos, right? <laughs> yeah, laugh for a minute. Uh, uh, I wasn't laughing. I was at, actually at that meeting on the right. Um, uh, we were in Los Cabos, Mexico, of all strange places, to meet with Vladimir Putin. And let me tell you, the meeting was a lot worse than that photo. A lot worse. So in the next 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, because you seem like you're a patient audience, I'm going to take you through and try to give you a few explanations of what happened between these two photos. And I'm going to walk you through what I think are the three big explanations. Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now my bluff. That's an acronym I learned in the government. I think actually I learned it from General Petraeus. My bottom line up front, if you need to tune out for 10 minutes and know where I'm going, is the third one is going to be the driver of the story. That's where I'm going to end up. But I want to walk you through the first two because elements of the first two are important to have what I think is a comprehensive explanation for how we got to where we're at. All right, first explanation. Anybody take International Relations 101? Do you teach that here at Hunter College? Well, you do. Uh, we do at Stanford, too. Uh, and if you take an intro course in International Relations in America, actually in Russia, too, you would learn uh, a theory. We call it realism, uh, sometimes structural realism. And this theory is based on power, power in the international system. We're, we're going to race through about 1,000 years of history here um, don't worry, I'm not going to take you through the whole map. Um, but what you see here is some states become more powerful, 
Other states on their borders become weaker. And as a result of that, you see powers rising and falling. And by the way, borders changing and borders changing a lot. And this is, you know, from a realist perspective, this has been the nature of politics in the international system, not just for the last few years, but for the last 50 years, for the last 500 years, going all the way back to Thucydides for the last thousands of years, right? Um, and so if you accept this theory, by the way, it takes a long time before Crimea becomes part of Russia, but we're not going to go all the way through the map. Uh, if you accept this theory, then what you see in the world today is just the natural order of international politics, right? Russia was weak after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia is back in terms of power, and Russia is back uh, in terms of all kinds of measures of power. And Russia is just behaving like a great power again. What's the big story? What's the big deal? Uh, we're back to normal history. History did not end like Fukuyama predicted. We're actually back to a lot of continuity in history. And I want to say at the outset that I believe, and part of my explanation in the book, is that power does matter. Power is a player in the system. If Russia were not a great power in the international system, and I consider Russia to be a great power, not a superpower, and not a rising superpower like China, but most certainly a great power in the international system. Uh, if they didn't have that power, we wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, anybody here from, I said Moldova earlier today, anybody here from Latvia? Anybody from Moldova? Anybody from Montenegro? Does anybody care about those three countries? <laughs> that came out wrong. That came out wrong. I got to be careful here. I, I noticed we're on tape. I better, I better be a little more diplomatic. Um, we, I care about those places. Actually, I was in Moldova with uh, Vice President Biden in 2011. It was a great trip. It was a fantastic trip. He actually spoke in front of 40 or 50,000 people. I think it may have been the largest crowd he ever had for one of his addresses. I love that place. But I'm not worried about Moldova invading Europe. I'm not worried about them you know, disrupting the balance of power in the international system for the obvious fact that they don't have the means to do that. Uh, now, there are times in our history when we have to worry about weak and collapsing states, like in Afghanistan after 2001. But just to, to be clear, power is a necessary part of this explanation. And the fact that Russia is a big power and the United States is a big power means that on some issues, we're going to clash irrespective of, of any other things. Okay, But I have two problems with that theory. It's not sufficient for me. It's a necessary part of the explanation, but not sufficient for two reasons. One, I can think of, and I'm used to walking around, I realize, as a, a professor, so I'll, I'll take this with me. Uh, um, um, uh, I can think of two problems with this theory. Number one, I can think of countries that rise in power and don't disrupt the borders of the international system and don't threaten the United States as the hegemon in that system. Think of Germany and Japan after World War II. Think of Poland. Right? Poland's a rising power compared to where they were 20 or 30 years ago, and yet nobody's losing sleep, at least not right now, about them uh, disrupting the borders of, of Europe. And even more provocatively, uh, maybe we'll leave this for questions, I don't think it's inevitable that the United States and China are going to clash and, 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 and have a great power struggle. I think that's a contingent outcome. It's not an inevitable out outcome. But the second reason why this power argument is not enough for me is because I want to know, well, why now? Russia, after all, had the power to be a disruptor a long, long time ago. Why is it just in the last couple of years that we've really had this tailspin and this confrontation with Russia? Moreover, there's a real puzzle to me about Ukraine. When I was a US ambassador, uh, and you know, we would sit down with our uh, country team, it's called, and we would begin to write up uh, you know, the memos that, were, that we wanted people in Washington to read about what was going on. That's, that's the main job of an embassy, right? Is to report, to inform our leaders about what was going on. And if not the top foreign policy objective for Putin, at least it, it was in the top three, was something I'm sure most of you have never heard of. It's called, it's, it is called the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and it was his idea to bring together the former states of the Soviet Union in an economic union as an offset 
if you will, to the European Union. He had Belarus and Kazakhstan lined up uh, already by the time I got there. The key to making this thing go was Ukraine. It was all about Ukraine. And here's why. Um, how many people here, and if you, you're from Ukraine, you can't answer, okay? Uh, or you're from Russia, you can't answer. How many people here have bought something with the label made in Russia on the back of it? Zdjelena of Russia. What'd you get? I know, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, a, you're a ringer, you, know, you can't answer. Anybody buy, buy anything here in New York? You must have things made in Russia here, yeah. Candy, which kind of candy? Okay, you can buy that here in New York. Well, New York, you can buy everything. Um, most Americans have never bought anything made in Russia. Uh, I, on occasion, buy Baltica beer in Menlo Park just for reminiscing about my time in Russia. But most of us don't because most, Russia doesn't export a lot of things that people buy abroad. Ukrainians do. Ukrainians buy things made in Russia. And as, as they were building this thing, to get those 45 to 47 million Ukrainians to buy things, they needed them in the system. By annexing Crimea, Putin guaranteed, I think, forever that Ukraine will never join his Eura Eurasian Economic Union. So what changed? Something changed along the way. Something more proximate to the story in 2014 changed. It's not just the balance of power. All right, second story. It's all our fault. The United States caused all this trouble. Um, this is very popular in Moscow, by the way. It's actually popular in Berkeley and maybe around here, too. I can think of some professors around here that might make this argument. Uh, in fact, I think I might be debating one tomorrow night um, uh, over at NYU in Columbia. But here's the story. Uh, Russia was weak, and we took advantage. We lectured them about democracy and markets. We expanded NATO when they couldn't do anything about it. We bombed Serbia. We invaded Iraq. And then we allegedly, I'm going to put the emphasis on the adverb, for supported color revolutions in Georgia 2003, uh, Ukraine 2004. And I'll come back to the Arab Spring in a minute. All of these events are true. All of these events happen. And all of these events most certainly created tension in US-Russian relation. That is true. Um, some more than others. I think actually the color revolutions were more important, uh, at least to Putin and some of these other issues, but they did exacerbate tensions. But in be between all of these events and our current conflict with Russia, there was an interregnum of cooperation. We called it the reset uh, when I was in the government and when I was working at the White House. Um, it was pretty simple theory about how to deal with Russia. The idea that, that came out of the transition and then later in the policy process in the early months of 2009 was on some things we're going to disagree with the Russians. We're going to agree to disagree about the borders of Georgia, by the way. We, we did that early on uh, after Russia had intervened there in August 2008. But on another set of issues, the presidents, and, the, and even before president, the president-elect, we would go to him and we'd talk about all this drama and US-Russian relations, that history that I just described. And he would say, hey, but, but don't we have some things in common? You know, don't we want to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? That happens to be on my mind today after the horrendous news out of the White House. Uh, don't we have an interest in reducing the number of nuclear weapons? And we'll say, yeah, Mr. President, but you got to remember there's this historical legacy. There's this culture clash. There's this personal thing between Putin and the, the Bush administration. And he said, OK, let's try. I'm the new guy. Let's think about looking for what he liked to call win-win outcomes that we're doing not as a favor to Russia, and we didn't expect any favors from Medvedev or Putin, but issues where we overlap that would be good for Russia and good for the United States. And that's the essence of the reset. By the way, this is our fourth day in office. Um, uh, my first day as a US government official in the, in the Oval Office. I was told later you're not supposed to touch the desk. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Nobody told me that when I walked in. Uh, and he's about to pick up the phone and call President Medvedev for the first time to lay out his argument about the reset. And it went pretty well, by the way, that call. And I think we got a lot of things done. Read the book, buy the book, send it to your mother. It's Mother's Day, don't forget. Uh, 
And you can march through. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but I want to remind you that just a few years ago, we were doing what I consider big things with the Russians, not just you know, holding hands and singing kumbaya and saying, I want a good relationship. And, you know, we had a nice piece of chocolate cake and everybody got along. That, that, it wasn't just the atmospherics. These were, in my opinion, uh, big things that were in America's national interest. And I'm going to presume that Russia and Medvedev thought they were in their interest, or why else would they do them? Nobody does any favors in diplomacy. Uh, they do things only if they think it's in their interest, as defined by them. Uh, so here we are in Prague. This was a great day. We flew to Prague. We signed the START Treaty, reducing by 30% the number of nuclear weapons allowed in the United States and Russia. You know, that's what I did in 2010. What did you do? Uh, and I say that because, I, and I, I, I'm sorry I'm so flippant about it, but most of the time in government, it's really hard to do anything. It's like completely difficult. There's an interagency process that uh, bogs you down. There's these other actors in the system, countries like Russia and China, that make it really hard to do something. 2010, we got a big thing, a big piece of business done. Uh, and that was an exciting day. And then we even ratified it, which was even harder. Uh, um, and that was a really exciting day to, to, to drink champagne with the president. Um, right before he went off on his vacation, the last day of, of, of the winter term in 2010. And we got a bunch of other things done. I won't go through them in detail, um, but, uh, but I want to stress these are big things that I think served America's national security. We built something called NDN, which again, you probably never heard of. Uh, it, it was a supply route system, airplanes, cars, uh, trains, uh, trucks that ran all the way through Russia, uh, through Central Asia, down into Afghanistan. Sometimes the planes would fly over Russian airspace with Russian sol uh, excuse me, with American soldiers on them, land in Kyrgyzstan, and then go into Afghanistan and fight against the Taliban. I don't think, there's some historians, there's some people that know the history better than I do. I think that was the first time since World War II, and I, I with FDR in my mind here, another cooperative time when we had a, a, that kind of military relationship with uh, Moscow, I think it was the first time since World War II where American soldiers were, were flying through Russian airspace. And that was important. We got it up to about 50 or 60 percent before I left the government, because before then, 90 percent of our supply routes went through Pakistan. And we had an idea that we were going to expand the war on terrorism into Pakistan. And you may remember uh, Ilya, Privyat, I just saw you there. Um, uh, you may remember that uh, in 2011, we actually violated Pakistani sovereignty, and we went in and we killed Osama bin Laden. I was at the White House that day. We could not have done that without NDN. We could not have done that without Russia. Same with Iran. UN Security Council Resolution 1929, the most comprehensive set of sanctions uh, endorsed by the United Nations ever, period. Can't do that without Russia. And then there's another piece that never gets written about, but I wrote about it in my book, the non-events, the things that don't happen, the dogs that sound like they're barking and then you forget about them. You never read on page one about the color revolution in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. You never read about the ethnic civil war in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. You never read about the conflict between Russia and the United States as we battled in this Russian sphere of influence after a color revolution, after the, the president had fled to Belarus, 100 people had died, 300,000 ethnic Uzbeks had fled into Uzbekistan. And I'll tell you, those were the scariest days of my time working at the White House because I thought this was going to explode into an ethnic civil war. It didn't happen. In fact, I just saw the interim president of Kyrgyzstan last week at Stanford, uh, Rosa Atambaeva. Uh, it didn't happen because we, we're working with our partners. Rosa was one of our partners. Medvedev was working with his side. We were working with the Uzbeks to try to defuse this conflict. And so this was a very scary moment. By the way, very important to us strategically because of the Manas Air Base that was there at the time. Didn't happen. That's another instance of cooperation. Uh, I'd like to remind you, this is just a few years ago, Russians and Americans in Colorado Springs jumping out of planes together in counter-terrorist um, uh, uh, training. And even on the economic side, uh, I see people here that know more about this than I do. Good to see you here, Bob. Uh, but 
we were moving in the right direction. All things were moving in the right direction. We got Russia into the WTO. We were increasing trade at, you know, it was a low, we were starting from a low bar, so it was moving in the right direction. But it was an optimistic time, even in terms of economics. And finally, just to remind you, over 60% of Russians back then had a positive view of the United States. And almost the same number was true here in the United States. That was just a few years ago. That wasn't ancient history. That was just a few years ago. And I want to just emphasize here that all of that cooperation happened after NATO expansion, after the Iraq War, after the Orange Revolution. So to put on my noodlehead social science hat for a minute, you can't point to these variables as your explanation for our current conflict if you don't account for that cooperation, right? All of these things, if they were so bad for our relationship, why did all that good news happen? That doesn't make uh, sense to me. By the way, on NATO expansion, because that gets a lot of attention, and I devote a lot of attention in the book to it, um, in the first three years that I was in the government, I was in every single meeting with President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin. I was on every single phone call with those two gentlemen. Uh, I was in every meeting but one. I missed one meeting uh, when I was ambassador. Uh, uh, President Obama used to invite me to meetings that normally ambassadors don't attend because I used to work for him in the White House. Not once in five years with either Putin or Medvedev did the issue of NATO expansion come up. It was a non-issue during the era of the reset. All right, so that gets me to my last argument. Uh, let me spend about 10 minutes on this and then take your questions. Russian domestic politics, that is, domestic politics influencing Russian foreign policy. And this is a complex story that I get into the details of in the book, so I urge you, I'm going to go over it rather superficially right now. Um, but there are really two major events internally in Russia that happened that I think really were the, the, the events that got us into this negative spiral that they're in today. First. Uh, Putin coming back as president, and second, uh, demonstration in 2011 and 2012. Um, uh, some of the organizers are here in the back room, I just saw, so maybe uh, you'll want to comment on that later. All right, first thing, Medvedev to Putin. They announced this in September 2011. I'm still working at the White House, working through my confirmation hearings, uh, having some really uh, quality time with my family in the Marriott Executive Day, uh, courtesy of some senators that had a hold on me. Uh, so we had to live there for six months waiting to go to Moscow. Uh, and in that time, uh, this is President Putin announcing that he's going to run for president again in the spring of 2012, and Medvedev is going to step aside and become prime minister. And, you know, it was about two or three days after this, uh, I was in to see the president about something else. And at the end of our meeting with him, he pulled me aside and said, hey, Mike, what do you think? What is this going to mean for U.S.-Russian relations? And I gave him the standard conventional answer of the government at the time, um, which is to say, well, Mr. President, we know that Prime Minister Putin, he's the main decision maker in U.S.-Russian relations. He's the big dog. Putin's just his, uh, Medvedev. He, he, you know, the, the, our assessment is that's that's, that's the way the intelligence community talked. Our assessment is that we have a high, medium, and low degree of confidence. You can only have three. You can't have 10. It's got to be one of those three. Uh, our assessment is, you know, he's been there for all that cooperation, and, and so now we've got to work with him. And the president said to me, come on, man. Uh, maybe he didn't say that. I, I keep got to remember we're on the record. He, he said to me, You're, you know that that's not true. And I said, yeah, I know it's not true uh, because... We knew that Putin had a different worldview, that he wasn't, uh, 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 he, he, he th all those things we saw, he was leaning in to cooperate. He was constrained, really constrained, and maybe not as brave as I would have liked him to be. But as we got to know Putin, it turned out that he did have a different worldview. I sat with these two gentlemen for many, many hours, and I can tell you the way they saw the world was fundamentally different. Putin see those, sees the world in zero-sum terms. He sees us as a competitor, not as a partner. He was trained in the school, the KGB school. He went to al for a while, but that's his formative years. Medvedev was much younger, a decade younger, a decade less of living in the Soviet Union and never working in the KGB. And this last point is the central one. 
Putin believes that the United States use overt and covert power to overthrow regimes we don't like. And guess what? There's a lot of empirical data to support Putin's hypothesis about American foreign policy over the last 70 years. That's true. In fact, we had that argument with him uh, when we went out to his dacha in July 2009. We were there for about three and a half hours. I think actually we were eating illegal caviar, we were told later. Um, <laughs> it was quite a spread. It was quite a spread. Putin was definitely trying to make an impression. And in this meeting, uh, about the first hour of it, Putin spent telling the new guy, right? Remember, Obama's just been in power a few months, telling him all the mistakes that Americans had made, mostly focused on the Bush administration. He, and he had prepared. He had done his homework. He was telling us in detail mistakes we had made. And in the code of all those mistakes was, if you just worked with us, maybe we could have avoided those. But you didn't respect me. You didn't bring me in. And this is the mess you made. By the way, he was pretty protective of President George W. Bush as a person. I think uh, uh, Putin likes uh, the president. He was really dismissive of the Bush administration and what we now call the deep state. That's definitely a theory that he has in the back of his mind. The CIA, the, the Pentagon, they have a big influence over policy because after all, that's the way it works in his system, right? When they got to Iraq, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting moment. Putin said, you know, you guys were complete idiots to go in. He, he probably didn't use the word idiot. Uh, but he, he really went on how stupid that war was. And the president, President Obama's a pretty good listener, by the way. He sat for 55 minutes listening to this soliloquy of how bad we had been. Uh, I could never sit for 55 minutes. I am grateful that you can sit for 35. Um, he listened to that whole thing, and he got to Iraq. He just turned to him and he said, you're right. I agree. And Putin was like, what? wait, hold on. You're the Americans. You're not supposed to agree with me. And he said, well, you know, maybe, Mr. Prime Minister, you don't know, but uh, well before it became popular to be against the war in Iraq, I was against that war. And I could tell that was, that was jarring to Putin because, you know, he didn't think of, of policy changes between presidents. We're America. We're not Democrats and Republicans. And as we went through after that, and we're walking out to the car, and they're kind of chit-chatting, uh, you know, uh, they were arguing about S-300s, I remember, whether they should sell them or not, and, and Obama was saying, please don't sell the S-300s, the anti-missile system, anti-aircraft system to the Iranians, and Putin was said, we already signed the contract. Uh, don't you guys believe in contracts? Um, uh, but at the end of it, I sensed that Putin was thinking, hey, maybe this guy is different. He most certainly looks different than all the other presidents. He, he was talking different than all the other presidents. And as we got into the car, you know, I mean, you can imagine Obama as we drove into town uh, to give a, he had to give a speech later that day. I mean, he was intrigued, you know, meeting Putin for the first time. He's an intriguing guy. Uh, love him or hate him, he makes an impression. And, uh, you know, we were talking about, well, maybe we can work with this guy. Maybe it'll work out. And then, 2011 happened. First, the Arab Spring started in Egypt, Libya. And let me pause on Libya. I want to remind you that on Libya, uh, maybe the high point of cooperation during the reset was President Medvedev abstained on the two Security Council resolutions that authorized the use of force in Libya. I was in the Kremlin with the Vice President the night he agreed to that. I'll tell you honestly, I was shocked by it. I did not expect it. He had chased everybody out, by the way, including Lavrov. He wanted to have a private conversation with Biden because he knew that this was going to be unpopular within his own system. Uh, that was an incredible breakthrough. Uh, Russia or the Soviet Union had never voted in the UN Security Council for the use of force to intervene in the sovereign affairs of another country. Never. Uh, kind of amazing but was so amazing that once this happened and once the war began, two days later, Putin, on the record, criticized Medvedev for the first time ever, to my knowledge, that he had supported this. Because he, then we on to Syria, then we're on to Russia. Because for Putin, these events confirmed his theory about American power. Here they are again. There it is, the CIA, working there, there it is. American planes bombing a country in the name of regime change. And here, 
there they are, supporting the opposition, handing out money to foment regime change against him. That was his reaction to those events. The last time that many people had been on the streets of Moscow was 1991. That's Manyash Square, for those of you who remember. It's now a shopping center. Um, that's the year the Soviet Union collapsed. That's the event that Putin called the, one of the most tragic uh, mo events of the 20th century. And he was remembering 20 years later that mobilization. By the way, I'm there. If you can see me, uh, I'm in that audience. I was there. I remember it vividly. And believe me, I'm sure Vladimir Putin knew I was there too. Um, and, you know, Putin's first reaction, and, you know, with people more expert in, than I in the room, I'm, I'm, I'm on a little shaky ground here, but the way I remember it, you know, he was first upset. He was pissed off at these people for protesting. It's like, I made you rich. I brought us back. The creative class, that they, as they were called, right? How could you betray me? I remember being at a meeting with him one day where he was kind of going off on these people. Like, how could they? I did this for them. Why are they turning on me? But his second argument was fear because of what I just showed you. That mobilization that happened in 1991 was happening again. And so he needed a new argument. Economic growth was no longer so sufficient, was slowing down. Remember, he's running for president at this time. And so that is the moment when they revive us, America, Obama, and later me personally, as the boogeyman that's seeking to overthrow them. And in particular, you know, working with the opposition that he needed to marginalize to say that these people were traitors to his system. And, you know, uh, that started before me. I want to make sure, uh, you know, as we teach at Stanford, correlation and causation are not the same thing. So the, the fact that I show up as ambassador in January 2012 does not mean that that's the moment of confrontation, even if the timing is similar. Uh, he was already talking about these kind of things before I showed up. But once I did show up, uh, it got pretty personal. Um, remember, they're running a campaign. They need to win. Uh, and one of Putin's advisors on the campaign, who I'd known for 20 years, uh, said to me when I went to see him one day, he said, um, uh, Mike, thank you for coming when you did. You are like manna from heaven for us. Uh, because of your profile, because of the things you've written before, you are really going to help us in this campaign. And he said, don't sweat it when we go after you. Just relax. Everything is going to get better after the election. You know, these, these campaign folks, they're cynical all over the globe. And this guy is very cynical. And off record, I'll tell you who I'm talking about, for those of you who know Russia well later. Um, and so, you know, they started to go after me. So I'm the guy in charge of Navalny, right, the opposition leader. Uh, I literally became the poster child uh, of this uh, effort. Uh, this is a poster, uh, a calendar put out, both in Russian and English. All the other months are various opposition figures. Uh, Ilya, I think you're in that, uh, that, that calendar, by the way. Um, um, in fact, there you are. Uh, Ilya Ponomaryov is in the poster on the left. He's sitting in the back. He caught my eye. Um, you know, you've heard of disinformation and fake news now. Well, I experienced it firsthand about me. Uh, there I am campaigning, allegedly, for Navalny um, during his uh, mayoral run. That obviously is not me. I hope that obviously is not me. Is it obvious? Uh, my hands are not that big. Look at it. Um, I wish they were. I, I, I would be a better basketball player. Um, uh, and the left is uh, actually where these were posters put up all throughout Moscow. That's a bus stop uh, on the eve of a very pivotal elect, uh, uh, demonstration, May 6, 2012 that turned violent and some people got arrested and some of those people are still in jail today. And there it is, it says May 6th, the political circus is again coming to the arena and I am there surrounded by other opposi uh, by, by opposition leaders, not other opposition leaders, by opposition leaders and it says I am the artistic director of this circus, okay? And then here, even if you don't speak Russian, these are some of the films and videos that you would see on Russian news 
Информирование ведомства сообщили прессе, что последним мероприятием посла, скорее всего, станет день 80-летия установления дипломатических отношений России и США. Что не понимают Россию, они говорят, что Here it's talking about my background as a specialist in uh, revolutions. I did not have a plane like that, by the way, for taxpayers. Here are opposition leaders coming to get their instructions from me. Uh, here are the fascists who are also under my uh, control. There's Mr. Navalny. There's Navalny again, who was just arrested four days ago. Boris Nemtsov, who was killed. Gary Kasparov, who lives here. Shurikova, who lives in Estonia. That was what I lived with. And this, you laugh, but it's actually not a laughing matter for me. This was horrible. Um, and actually, this is the first time I've ever shown this slide, ever, uh, been talking about Russia. This, this video, this is actually the last frame of a video that was put out in February 2012. And the implication was, as you, well, as you can see in Russian and English, I'm a pedophile. And how do you deal with that? I'm not a pedophile. Am I supposed to tweet that? And oh, OK, but you are. Oh, and, and already, like, like I, I talk about this with some of my friends, that even by I say it now, people are kind of wondering. And you're like thinking, oh, maybe I should look that up. Uh, if you look it up on Yandex, by the way, on the Russian search engine, there'll be 4 million hits to this day with this phrase. We tried to take it down. I had friends at Google, so we took it down from YouTube. Uh, but the nature of disinformation means that it keeps living and keeps growing, and there's no way to deal with it. Um, and this disinformation campaign, this is just a smorgasbord. Read the book to get a bigger flavor. This is what we were facing at, the, at that time. Now, it wasn't just about me. I just want to remind you, this is the president. On the left, obviously, uh, the, uh, the gentleman on the right is the leader of ISIS. Uh, this is from Kisilov's show. For those of you who watch Russian television, it's a Sunday talk show kind of like our 60 Minutes. And Dmitry, who I've known forever uh, in this uh, segment, is saying, you know, at, at first blush, you wouldn't think that the leader of ISIS and President Obama have anything in common. But if you dig deeper, Barack Hussein Obama and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi actually share the same worldview and the same set of ideas. And then the last straw, and I'll, I'll end in just a couple of minutes here. During this period, we still were cooperating with Russia. I want to stress that. We were still cooperating with Russia. Uh, we did a big Syria chemical weapons deal, for instance. Uh, there were pockets of cooperation er, even during this tumultuous period. But then again, people on the street mobilizing, right? Do you notice the theme here? Egyptians, Syrians, Libyans, Russians, now Ukrainians, on the street mobilizing for, for political purposes of which we were not in control and we most certainly did not spark. This time it was because Yanukovych didn't sign an accession agreement with the European Union. I remember I was working in the embassy. I thought, no big deal. You know, There's always another negotiation. Diplomats always show up to negotiate again. That's what we do. Uh, we'll get to it later. Maybe we'll get to it after Yanukovych wins re-election, which I actually thought would have been a much more appropriate time to engage in that negotiation. But Ukrainians had a different view. In fact, one in particular, his name is Mustafa Naim, uh, immigrant from Afghanistan. He went online that night and said, this is crazy. Why is our president doing this? Uh, if you agree with me, uh, like my page here. And if we get to 10,000 likes, I'll meet you at Maidan. And he got 50,000 likes within an hour. They showed up on Maidan. They stayed there for a long time in a protest. It got bloody. People were killed. 100 people were killed. We intervened, we and the Europeans, to try to cut a deal between the opposition and President Yanukovych. And on February 21st, I remember it vividly. I was at the Sochi Olympics, having a fantastic time, by the way. It was a fantastic event. Uh, on my, my Blackberry blew up. We have an agreement. We're going to avert this standoff between the regime and the opposition. Six hours later, Yanukovych was in Rostov. That's a small uh, city in Russia. Why he left when he did, we can talk about in questions. Uh, there were some Americans that thought that was a great uh, event. I remember reading on my BlackBerry. 
Uh, but I was at Sochi with Bill Burns at the time, the Deputy uh, Secretary of State, and we both knew that this was not going to be a great event. Putin was going to strike back, and he did. First taking Crimea, and when that was easy, then going into Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Ukraine. So the good news to conclude, well, one last thing. After being on defense, then he goes on offense. This is a story I hope everybody in this room would know well. So the good news, to conclude, I don't believe that Putin has a master design to recreate the Soviet Union. I don't believe that. I think these have been tactical, emotional reactions to the various things I just talked about. Nor do I believe that there's some innate cultural or historical reason or the balance of power in the international system uh, curses us forever to be in conflict with Russia. If you buy my story, you see the role of individuals and their ideas in shaping history both for good or for ill. The bad news is I think Putin's given up on working with us. I think he said to hell with the Americans after 2014 in Ukraine. Uh, and he is now in, in, in a place where he doesn't even want to be part of our clubs. He's perfectly happy to be on the outside. He's not going to change his mind. He just was, uh, went through his inauguration on Monday, going to be there until 2024. I think he could be there a lot longer than that. And he works out two to three hours a day. He's in good health. So I predict, tragically, my book is a, is a book about tragedy, about tragedy in U.S.-Russian relations, and also tragedy for people like me who are hoping for a better, different kind of relationship with this country that I love. Tragedy, however, I think we're going to be there for a long time. Oh, and that, I'll just end on that. And that, well, let's not even talk about this. This is just like for the future, what we need to do. Uh, if you want to dive into that, buy the book. Thank you all. You've been very patient. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. I, I went longer than I wanted, but you were listening. I could tell. So, yeah. And why don't you wait for a microphone and then introduce yourself uh, so that everybody knows who you are. Uh, my name is Sam Rosen. Um, today, uh, with the uh, pulling out of the Iran deal, it, it seems clear that that Trump owes something to the Russians, either for getting them elected or for the money that they've provided them with over the last 10 years. Was this a red letter day for Putin with Trump having driven or causing a wedge to be driven between the United States and the rest of NATO, something that Putin could never have done on his own with his military or otherwise? So I'm going to answer the question, uh, but I'm going to deflect on the premise before, OK? Uh, the epilogue of my book is called Trump Putin, uh, and I go into the details of what we knew and what we didn't at the time the book went to press. Um, I know uh, that, and, and I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming, that uh, President Putin preferred Trump to Clinton uh, in 2016, for very rational reasons, by the way. Uh, if I were Putin, I would prefer Trump too. Because Trump said things during the campaign that were in Russia's national interest, and Clinton said the opposite. By the way, I, I, I went over it quickly, but back in 2011, December 2011, uh, Secretary Clinton put out a statement criticizing those parliamentary elections that led to that mobilization that I showed you. Putin didn't forget that. And I remember he had his president at the time, Medvedev, call Obama and say, does, does she speak for you? because we were a little surprised at how strong that statement was. So their, their personal chemistry, she writes about in her own book, uh, was never good. And he did blame her, in part, for what happened there. What they have on him or not, let's let Mr. Mueller answer that part. Uh, and I really hope that we do get a chance to allow him to answer that. Uh, what I will say, just and I'm, I believe it, just a, as a matter of policy, yes, of course, today was a bad day, from my point of view, in terms of American national interests. The, go the goal of that agreement, uh, you know, I was part of the team for a while that was working on that, and then friends of mine uh, uh, accomplished that goal. The goal of that agreement was to deny Iran nuclear weapons. And when people say temporary, you know, it's for 10 to 15 years, by the way. That's temporary. A lot can happen in 10 to 15 years. And it was achieving its goal. Secretary Mattis himself said that. You don't have to believe me. Believe Secretary Mattis. Um, 
most of his administration, by the way, supported that. Well, the, the administration's changed now. Uh, I don't understand how Americans' national interests are advanced by pulling out of this agreement. I honestly, I can't even argue with it, as I said in an interview earlier today, because I don't even understand the, the theory. I don't even understand the theory of the case. How are we better off being out of this agreement, just in terms of our relationship with Iran? But then, to your point, you know, what's the one thing a president could do to bring together our NATO allies in Russia and China? This is it. Uh, so they're all together, and we're on the outside. That does not serve American national interests. Yes, over here. Can, can I couldn't hear the question? <clears throat> no, the NDN's kind of fading. So um, the Newton, uh, Northern Distribution Network that I talked about, I think there are, there are, and I should check for you, so hit me on Twitter or hit me on email and I'll get you a definitive answer. It definitely has faded from the, the peak back when we were surging uh, uh, for two or three reasons. Number one, Remember, we were surging at that time, so we needed to move a lot of equipment in. Now we're at a different phase of the war where we're, we've moved a lot of equipment out. So That's Russia? Yeah. Well, let me tell you a story, okay? Um, we, uh, first meeting between Obama and Medvedev uh, took place in April 2009 in London. I was the, you know, I was the Russia guy at the National Security Council, so this, I'm in charge of this, we call them bilats, right, bilateral meetings on the sidelines, I think it was a G20 meeting. Um, and let me just tell you on a personal level, uh, this, was, this was a very scary moment for me, like I'm in charge of this meeting between Medvedev and Obama, first time they'd ever met, and I didn't really know how things work, right, uh, setting up our, our blue tents so that uh, and our noise systems so that people couldn't hear what we were saying in the Churchill Hotel, that's where we were staying. Uh, I remember writing the talking points late that night, um, and there was a bit of drama right at the end of it because um, uh, the night before, a human rights activist named Lev Ponomaryov um, had just been beaten up, and I got word from that from our embassy, and uh, we had this big debate, should we bring this up or not? Should we have Obama speak about it? And, when, and I was f saying he should mention it, and we kind of compromised that he would mention it in the pull aside, and then it would be a game call for uh, uh, Obama whether he'd do it, and to his credit, at least from my point of view, he did do it, and Medvedev, by the way, said, you're absolutely right, this is horrible, I read about it on the internet myself. Uh, that was an interesting little data point for me moving forward. But we got to the meeting, and you'll not read about this in the readout. Uh, you know, when I was at the White House, uh, oftentimes I was quoted in the press as a SAO, senior administration official, right? And that day I was the, the SAO in charge of reading out the meeting. That's what we used to do. Uh, by the way, the Trump administration should get back to doing that. Uh, you know, we, we, don't, we shouldn't have to learn about what happened in these meetings on the TAS uh, website. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, it's a good thing to, like, tell people what they're doing and to shape your story before the other side does. So, um, you won't read about it because we didn't know where it was going to go, but a big part of that meeting was about Kyrgyzstan. It was about Manas, the air base, which is part of the Northern Distribution Network. Because in February 2009, President Bakiev had just been to Moscow and met with uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Putin, who basically gave him a $2 billion economic assistance program, and 24 hours later he announced that he was closing Manas, right, the president of uh, Kyrgyzstan. And that was a really big crisis for us. At that time, over 95% of our soldiers flew into Manas uh, before they went into Afghanistan. So it was a key staging uh, base. So Obama, in this meeting, you know, he gets to the talking points, the ones that I had written up for him. You know, everybody contributed, but I, I remember like watching him read my talking points and thinking what a big responsibility this is to get this stuff right. Because uh, I'd never done that before, right? I'd, I'd written a lot of words in a lot of obscure academic journals, uh, never once for the president to use in his interactions with Medvedev. And when he got to this, and I'm going to paraphrase for those watching, I want to make sure uh, I'm just paraphrasing, right? Um, uh, but, but Obama kind of used this shtick. He said, hey, you know, I'm the new guy here. I don't really understand foreign policy. But, you know, I read your speech, Mr. President, about 
spheres of privilege interest, which Medvedev had said a few months earlier. And he said, that really seems like a, an outdated idea to me. But, you know, that's the 19th century. Like, like, why does that matter in this transnational world that we live in? And he said, look, what are we doing in Manas? Uh, we're, we're sending soldiers there that are then going to fly into Afghanistan. They're not doing anything in Kyrgyzstan. They're, they're just out on the base. And then we put them on planes. And then, you know, they take hot showers and get hot meals and get some sleep in Manas in Kyrgyzstan. But then we put them on planes and go to forward operating bases. And what do they do? They go and they try to kill terrorists, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, the same people that were Russia's enemies. So why is that not in your interest? Why, why don't you want us fighting them? Because if we're not there, they're going to be fighting you. Um, and again, I'm paraphrasing. He wasn't that flippant like I am. Uh, but I could tell Obama, uh, Medvedev was like, well, maybe he's right about that. That's interesting. Uh, Lavrov was looking at his shoes the whole time. I remember that. He, he did not like this conversation. But, uh, I, uh, you know, it took a lot more work after that. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, we ended up keeping Manas open for another seven years after that. Putin closed it on us after the, the story that I just told. Yes. Uh, good, after, good evening, uh, Olena Nikolenko, uh, yeah, Poda Yeah, good to see you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, well, in your presentation, you discussed a lot of uh, anti-government uh, protests around the globe, in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, and now there are protests happening, uh, the revolution <laughs> in Armenia. Yes. Uh, and uh, in, in Ukraine, when protests were happening in Ukraine, uh, the Russian government reacted uh, quite openly and quite harshly. Now it looks like uh, they changed their approach and working kind of more behind the scenes. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you think will happen in Armenia? And um, uh, why did Russia, learn, uh, did Russia learn its lessons and, you know, basically c continue to intervene, but just in another format? And the second question, because you have been to recently to Ukraine, okay. you know, what, 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 um, what do you think is the future of Donbass? Uh, 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 <laughs> is, um, in your opinion, Ukrainian government really making an effort, the incumbent president, to resolve the conflict? Or, because there are a lot of skeptics yeah. who argue that it's in his interest to continue yes. it uh, okay. going on. Thank you. So, Alana, you're actually the expert on Armenia, not me. You should answer your own question. Um, uh, we can talk maybe later about what you think. Um, I do think there's been some learning here, uh, absolutely. Uh, I do think they were surprised. Uh, as you know, this academic literature better than I do, but Armenia has always been a place considered that where these kinds of things could never happen. And that should be a lesson to all of us about uh, our predictive powers that we always assign to even countries like Russia. Um, I don't think the drama's done there. Uh, I think right now they're, they're working on a cooperative strategy uh, in terms of learning. Um, obviously, the dynamics with us are less important uh, to them uh, because President Trump and this administration are not engaged. And, and you know, they know that. The Russians know that. They're, they're not... They're not sending their assistant secretary, you know, to Armenia, uh, to the best of my knowledge. They're not, they're not worried about that. They're focused on other things. But I'm not ready yet. I think it depends on where the story ends. And if things turn in a more negative Russian way, which it may or may not, then some of the stories I just described here you might see appearing again. With respect to Donbass, an equally difficult question. Uh, I don't have a good answer there. Um, you know, my own view, just, it's just my personal view, I, um, I just was in Ukraine yeah, just six or seven days ago, maybe ten days ago by now, this book tour is a bit of a blur for me, um, and did speak with lots of leaders in the government and opposition leaders as well. Uh, I'm not optimistic about any breakthrough there. You know, a few months ago, there was a lot of buzz about, you know, Kurt Volker, our special representative, was meeting with Mr. Surkov. And there was all this talk, I remember when I was at the Munich Security Conference in particular, that Putin needs a breakthrough here before the, the World Cup, and this is a moment, and you guys should lean in. That seems to have all dissipated. So the external piece, I think, is dissipated. Uh, and the internal piece, I just think they're, because they're already, already focused on the election uh, in 2019, the presidential election, uh, I don't think you're going to see any bold moves from anybody in Kiev in terms of some breakthrough. Um, you know, 
I think, tragically, uh, what uh, needs to happen in Ukraine is make the, the part that is not occupied successful. Focus on that. Uh, you know, there all this talk about Donbass. Uh, what about democracy in Ukraine? What about corruption in Ukraine? That, get that right. Make your part of Ukraine attractive and wealthy and make people in Donbass and, and down the road Crimea that they want to join. That's the way that you can fight this struggle against Russia, the occupation, without waiting for the United States or, or Angela Merkel to come help you. We should still do those other things, but those things that can be done internally uh, needs to be done by Ukrainians themselves. Uh, two last questions. So here and here. I was told very strictly two last questions. So, Hello, my name is Valeria. And um, I was wondering, the other day I was listening to Alexei Benediktov. Yes. And he said that Putin took Crimea because he wants to secure a place in a history. And yes. he is dying to be in textbooks. And I was He's going to be in textbooks what, no matter what, that's well, for sure. Uh, I was wondering what you think about this. And the second question is, your post on Facebook make me f guilty because I think you love Russia more than I am, and I moved here only three years ago. So hmm. I was I wondering. Left four years ago. <laughs> so I was wondering where is this love okay. for Russia come from in the first place? You know what? We're going to reverse the order because I want to end on your last question. So I'm going to, if, if it's OK, why don't you ask your question? And I'm going to end on that last one, OK? Thank you, Dennis DiLorenzo. Um, for many uh, decades, the United States has tried to advance uh, human rights in its negotiations with the Russians. Um, in, in more recent history, the lead up to the Soji Olympics, there was a great deal of concern, especially amongst the Western democracies in terms of participating in the Soji Olympics because of what was going on in Russia, specifically in terms of the persecution, the torture, and the murder of gay men. Um, I understand that there was a lull at the time of the Soji Olympics, but that this has resumed. And there are confirmed reports about concentration camps at this point where men, specifically men, gay men, whether gay or perceived yeah, mean, to be right? gay yeah. are being tortured and murdered. Um, and by the way, the use of the term pedophile was part of the propaganda that the Russians used to dehumanize gay people. In fact, most of the, uh, uh, Putin himself included, have referred to gay people as either non-existent or simply subhuman. Yes. But the <clears throat> use of pedophile I believe is code for homosexual, male homosexual. So could you speak to the persecution of gay people in Russia and what is happening now? Because I think it's yeah. worse than ever. Okay. So let me go in reverse order. Um, first of all, you're right. There's some horrible things happening in Chechnya, to be specific, right? Um, and uh, it disappoints me that the Trump administration, as far, as far as I know, has said virtually nothing about that. Uh, for whatever our sins and evils, and you got to read the whole book. Actually, you just have to buy the book. You don't have to read it. Um, and you need to buy it for your friends and your relatives. Both Mother's Day and Father's Day is coming up. Uh, whether you read it or not, that's up to you. But you have to buy the book. But I go into this. Uh, whether, you know, who's at fault, I talk about some of the mistakes we made, too. And by the way, I'm quite critical I didn't talk about it so much tonight, but I'm quite critical of some of the things we did as administration and even some of the things that I did as ambassador. And, and I, I decided to be brave about talking honestly about it so that you might believe the critical things I say about other actors, including people like Putin. Uh, one thing I'm very proud of is that throughout all of this stuff, we did speak out uh, about democracy and human rights. We took those decisions. It wasn't always popular, by the way, in the Obama administration. There was a fight over that. Uh, we did that. Uh, we took a stand on uh, laws, including what we c considered to be discriminatory anti-LGBTQ uh, laws in uh, Putin's Russia. And we sent a delegation to the Sochi Olympics that expressed that uh, displeasure. Um, 
And one of the things we did right after Sochi, by the way, we never talked about it, but um, I, because of Sochi, I got to know the, the gay uh, community, the, the, the athletic community in Moscow, and they were putting on the Gay Olympics after Sochi, and they couldn't find a place to play basketball that was safe. So they had their tournament at the Moscow, at our embassy. Uh, so, you know, we, we were leaning in, I think, on these issues, both publicly, and sometimes you just do it privately, and sometimes that's important, too. Uh, and there's no excuse for what's going on. I, I, what, what else can I say? It's, it's horrific what is going on, uh, and I wish our government would pay more attention to it. Uh, Benedicto. Um, this is a crowd I feel a little nervous. There's some, there's some real experts in this room, so you might be able to call me out. Um, but I dare you, not right now maybe, don't get your phones out, but send it to me on Twitter or Facebook or wherever you can find me. Uh, McFall, uh, find me on the email. I dare you to find a speech before 2014 where Vladimir Putin says, Crimea is so important, it needs to be part of Russia, it's always been part of Russia, and if it's not part of Russia, you know, the Russian heart and soul can never be whole and unified. I dare you to find that speech for me because I don't think it exists. I can find you the speech where he says in 2008, we would never go into Crimea because we recognize the borders of Ukraine. We settled that issue with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So maybe he had a change of heart later, but it's a change of heart later, and it, it plays, it, the talk goes back to my story about how this was tactical and emotional. Now, some people say, well, of course they had a game plan, a, a military plan to take Crimea. Well, of course they do. You would be shocked at the military plans that we have to, to do all kinds of crazy things around the world. That's what governments do. We plan for all kinds of contingencies. I, I can't talk about them because they're all classified, but the first one of that I participated in I was like, you got to be kidding. This scenario is absolutely kooky. But we have those scenarios. We have them in the bank because in the event, so do Russia. But that doesn't mean because there was a plan on the shelf that he was planning to do that. Does he want to be in history on that? You know, Alexei, who I know well, that, of course, I agree with. He, he does see himself as the, the great restorer of Russia as a great country. And, and most certainly, he's thinking in those historic terms today. I personally want to be clear. I want Russia to be great too. I think Russia could be a great country. I think it could be a lot greater had they not done certain things under Putin. In the economy, in the freedom of society, there's some incredibly talented people there that would be thriving under a different system, would be thriving if there weren't all these sanctions because of Crimea. Uh, and I know a lot of them because 40, 50,000 of them live where I do, in the Silicon Valley. I meet these people all the time. I know these people. They are talented. They have founded some of the most important country, uh, uh, companies that we have in the Silicon Valley. They should be in Russia. And so I want Russia to be great. Uh, I just have a different, ne different definition of great than maybe Vladimir Putin does. And that gets me to the third thing about my love for Russia. So I went as a kid. Right? I, I literally, I'd never been abroad. My first trip abroad, you know, most people go to London, to Paris. You know, I went to Leningrad. Um, and I'll tell you honestly, I had a great time. I had a fantastic time. It was white nights, uh, my first time abroad. Um, I had this friend from Princeton who we spent a lot of time together with. Um, uh, she was great, uh, uh, <laughs> just to be clear what I'm alluding to there. And, uh, you know, standing in line for an hour to get an ice cream cone, I was like, what? You know, I'm standing with my friend Irene. This is great. Oh, and it's only 10 kopecks. So oh, and they even sprinkled a little chocolate on top. What's not to like? Um, and I came back, you know, things were not as bad as I thought, right? It wasn't Oh, this scary place with all these eight-foot people, you know, talking about communism. Those were there, too. Um, I went back just to finish the story, because um, in case my wife might watch this. Uh, I went back to Russia, the Soviet Union, in uh, January 1985. Uh, my Russian was better then. Um, I was there for longer. Um, uh, it was winter in Moscow. Um, my then-girlfriend, now wife, was living in Italy, so uh, was not standing around with me uh, getting ice cream. Um, and I got more into the fabric of that society back then. I met, you know, um, uh, refuseniks, I met dissidents, and that's when I, I, as I write about in the book, that's when I realized that, 
in the long run, if this, this regime doesn't change, it's going to be harder for us to cooperate. But in the thick and thin of all of it, and I just want to end on this note, it's not about politics, it's about people. I can't travel to Russia right now. Maybe you can, I can't. I'm on the sanctions list. Um, uh, the last former ambassador to Moscow that was on that list uh, was George Kennan, so I'm in good, I'm in good, I'm in a good, you know, I'm on, in good company, but, uh, you know, it make, it's tragic for me because over the years, some people I've known for three decades, some of the closest friends I've made in life are Russians. Some of them disagree with me radically about politics. Some of them work for Putin's government. Some of them are brave opposition leaders fighting uh, for a better country to this day, taking tremendous risks. Um, but they're all my friends. And, and, and uh, you know, I've added it up over time. I think I've lived in that country six or seven years over the course of my life. So if I'm, I'm such a Russia, you know, sometimes people accuse me of being anti-Russian. Well, if I'm so anti-Russian, why have I lived so much time in my, of my adult life there? It's because of those relationships with real life people, real life Russians. So you can disagree, just like you can in America. You can disagree with President Trump and still love America and love Americans. I can disagree with Putin and still love Russia and love Russians. Thank you all.